All right, I'm here. Twitch.tv slash 110sports, 110sportsmedia.com slash live. Thank you so much for joining us on a on a Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us. We got a lot to get to today. Got a lot to get to today. Uh, the Pacers just hired a new head coach, Nate Bjorkgren. There's a new Nate in town. Nate McMillan being fired. Uh, it's been uh, since right after the end of the Pacers season at this point. Uh, but they're introducing the Pacers head coach, Nate Bjorkgren, right now. That introductory press conference is happening as we speak. Um, so at 11.20 or so after this first segment, uh, I'll do some some looking through Twitter and looking at the uh, looking at those uh that press conference looking at some of the tweets from the people that are that are live tweeting it and we're going to talk about him at eleven twenty or so uh another first year head coach uh getting the call a uh, first time nba head coach getting the call uh to be a head coach next season in the nba there have been a couple of them now uh, in the coaching carousel for this nba off season so we'll get to that at eleven twenty or so you know, I really thought that that the Cowboys getting a new head coach might make them less of a train wreck. Cuz by cuz Jason Garrett's just bad football coach. At least in my opinion. Mike McCarthy. Solid football coach. But now the Cowboys players, you know, they're publicly talking about their discontent with the Cowboys coaching staff. So we'll talk about that. But but at the same time, not all of it can can be blamed. It can be put on the shoulders of the coaching staff, in my opinion. So we'll talk about both sides of the equation at 11.40 or so, get some FYI and at the end, and uh, get out of here on a Wednesday. So that's the show. Lots to get to, of course. But what I want to start with is the World Series. Game one of the World Series last night. Dodgers, 8-3, to three, pretty convincing win for the Dodgers in Game 1 of the World Series. Everything was on display. Everything was on display. Let's run through it, um, starting with Kershaw. Kershaw goes 6, 78 pitches, striking out 8, giving up just one earned run. It was a Kiermaier home run. I'm, I'm, he was lights out, first of all. He was locating nicely. His slider clearly had some action on it, had some bite back to it that he just didn't have in the the NLCS. He looked healthy, and it was it really was it was truly a lights out performance. He made one mistake. It was just it was a breaking ball that had no action on it whatsoever. Left it up, Kiermaier hitting it out in the the top of the fifth. But the Dodgers never trailed in this game. Two run home run from from Bellinger in the bottom of the fourth. Uh, another towering shot, not quite the same as the one uh, in near the end of the game, in Game Seven of the NLCS, but but a shot nonetheless. And that his his celebration was funny after dislocating his shoulder celebrating the the NLCS home run. He was he was basically just tapping foots with he's basically basically playing footsies with with all of his teammates after the home run it was funny it was it had to have been the most watched celebration or the most critiqued analyzed celebration maybe ever i mean it, when he hit the home run i wasn't even i was more curious about what he was gonna do when he got back to the dugout and it was a bunch of it was like they were all dancing together they were uh, you know it was like fist bumps, but with but with your feet, it was pretty pretty funny. And after the mistake that he made in the NL, in the NLCS, you, you you love to see that as a Dodgers fan, as a Dodgers owner, as Dave Roberts, that that Cody Bellinger choosing a slightly less obstructive way of of celebrating a home run. Um, you know, honestly, I don't understand why Kershaw was taken out when he was. Now it was, you know, after six, it's eight one after six. He goes six innings. You know, the the bottom of the fifth takes forever because 
It's a four run ending for the Dodgers. And we'll get to that ending here in a few minutes, but he goes out, shuts him down in the sixth. And so through six, he's only thrown 78 pitches and you're up eight, one. So I, I, I understand why he's taken out there. I mean, you're going to win this game unless something really bad happens. But, you know, they take him out and the Rays immediately score two runs. And, and there's just a part of me that is, you know, there's so many analytics and things and, and advanced metrics and and overthinking. And, and, and that's what... And clearly it works because that's what base baseball has become, the data statistics-driven sport. And so clearly it works. But data and analytics and advanced metrics, it's all just... It's all fancy words for overthinking to a certain extent. And taking out Clayton Kershaw when he's dealing and he can't be touched and he's only thrown 78 pitches through six innings, that's overthinking it. If he can't get touched, why is he, I mean, I mean, maybe, you know, he throws, you know, 12 more pitches, 20 more pitches in the top of the seventh. And then he's pushing 95 pitches for the game. And then, okay, then you take him out. But I don't understand why you give the, the the Rays the chance to get that kind of momentum. They came out and immediately scored two runs. And they scored two runs in a fashion that the Rays don't score runs. And that's with stringing together singles. That's not how the Rays score runs. They hit solo shots. That's what they do. And in the top of the seventh, you had a single from Margot. A double from Wendell that got Margot to third. And then Brousseau single to right. And then Kiermaier single to right. To score Margot and win it. Like the, the Rays don't do that. And they came out and did that immediately after they take Kershaw out of the game. It's. It was an unnecessary move. And it ended up being fine. Which is why they did it ultimately. Because even if your bullpen gives up a couple runs. You still win 8-3. to three. And. You know, I say this fully understanding that the Dodgers had just scored eight straight runs. They were up 8-1, and the Rays don't come back and aren't going to be able to come back from an 8-1 deficit in this series. So I get it. I do. But at some point, it just feels like there's an unnecessary amount of overthinking when it comes to that sort of thing in baseball. And then on the other side of things, like the Rays never let guys throw as many pitches as Glass now threw. He threw more pitches than any starter has thrown for the Rays this season, and he was leaking oil for a while. There was a point in the fifth inning where, you know, he was. You know, he was facing he was facing Justin Turner. And then I believe Turner got a hit. So that would have been the bottom of the fifth. Okay, so he strike oh he so he strikes out Turner, but then Max Muncie comes up, a left handed pitcher, and I thought they had a left hander going in they had Yarborough a left hander going in the bullpen. I thought, okay, they're going to bring him in to face Max Muncy. And they didn't, didn't bring him in. And then, but he faced Max Muncy. Muncy grounds into a fielder's choice to first and bets scores. And then Will Smith singles, singles to center and Seager scores. And I, I just, the leash has never been super long for, pitchers for the race that are dealing and that's partly just the way that they that they piece together their bullpen and things but Glasnow had a had such a long leash and one that I wasn't expecting him to have and he was leaking oil it's not like he was lights out and they were giving him more leash he was he gave up several runs and I don't actually know how many runs ended up being in his name let's see six earned so he got all six of those right that makes sense of course uh Six earned runs and four and a third. That was just surprising to me that 
that that's how the Rays approach that. Mookie Betts did literally everything. Two for four with a home run. At the bottom of the fifth, he walks. Then steals second. Free tacos, baby. Let's go. Steals third. Another free taco. Let's go. Steal base, steal taco. It's the Taco Bell promotion for the World Series, in case you don't know what I'm talking about. But... And John Smoltz called it. He said, you know what, Mookie's, we're going to get our first free taco here. Mookie's going to steal on glass now. That's exactly what happened. Um, but he, he steals second, and then they double steal. So they got runners on second and third. And then he's just such a smart base runner and was able to score. I mean, it was a hard hit ground ball to first, and Mookie was still able to score because of that secondary lead he was getting. And on that pitch, the third baseman, Wendell, he didn't come back to the bag to sort of bring Mookie back at all. And and as a result, Mookie was able... I mean, that, that ball that Muncie hit was pretty much right at Diaz at first base, and it didn't end up mattering. Um, and he has made a decent throw, but he was kind of off balance because he had to, it, it was to his to his right a little bit, but it was it was perfect base running. And then in the in the bottom of the next inning, he hits a home run. He you know he's flashing his glove in the NLCS. He makes you know three of the five best catches of you know maybe three of the best catches of the postseason. At least three of the five. The two home run robs were were two of the best of the postseason and and two of the highlight uh, you know catches of the year. And then in the World Series in game one, he you know he's well on his way to a World Series MVP at this point. Two for four, a home run, two stolen bases, scores a run. Can you imagine, you know, from defense to power to base running, I mean Imagine letting this guy go. Imagine trading this guy for a prospect. Can you imagine that? And now the Mookie's going to be doing all of those things with Dodgers taped across his chest for the rest of his career. He was absolutely fantastic. The Dodgers proved in this one that they that they have it all. I mean, this is a team that hit 16 home runs in the NLCS, led the majors in home runs in the regular season, has the power. But here's the play-by-play of their their four-run fifth inning. Betts walk, Betts steals second, Seager walk, Turner strikes out swinging, but Seager and Betts double steal. Muncie grounds into a fielder's choice. Smith singles to score. Uh, Smith singles to score Seager. Taylor singles to left to score Muncie, and Hernandez Hernandez singles to left to score Smith. No home runs. Now they got two solo shots in this game. No, sorry, not two solo shots. You got a, a two-run home run from Bellinger and then another solo shot from Betts. But they can do it all on the offensive side of the baseball. They can hit the home runs if they need it. Like I said, you get a Betts home run and a Bellinger home run. They're getting doubles. They're getting... They're stringing together singles to score a lot of runs after really good base running puts them in a really nice position to score if they just string a couple hits together. They can do it all. And then on top of that, Kershaw looked like a Cy Young winner. He set the tone for the Dodgers. The the Rays couldn't touch him. He at one point uh, retired 13 batters in a row. Ended up giving up two hits and six innings pitched. The one hit was the very first batter of the game, and then we talked about Kiermaier's home run. 78 pitches, 53 strikes, a 1.5 ERA, 8 Ks. He was lights out. 
So you, you, you saw in every single aspect, you saw you, you got this great starting pitching from Kershaw. You got the power early in the game from Bellinger to to put them up uh, up early. And then you get this ending where you just piece a bunch of runs together as the starters leaking oil. You get the guys that come in from the bullpen immediately. And then all of a sudden, and then you score two runs the following inning and you're up 8-1. Like that, they've got it all. They it, it was on display why the Dodgers have been the best baseball team all season. Why they were a team that was on pace to break the wins record or to tie the wins record. Excuse me. It's it wasn't hard to see why they're such a good baseball team last night, and the pieces that they have in place just was not. Was not difficult at all. The Rays are really going to struggle in this series whenever they're down multiple runs. Now, of course, Blake Snell and Charlie Morton could go out in the next two games and throw gems, and the Rays find a way to score three runs, and they win baseball games. That And, and this is a Rays team that is, this is a darn good baseball team. And in the middle of this, you know, the the Dodgers, they have some pitchers that lack extensive postseason experience. Now, so did the the Rays, and there was a crazy stat that only one guy in the, you know, halfway through the game of the 11 guys that have played for the Dodgers, only one of them, Will Smith, was not making his World Series debut. And the 11 players that the Rays had put on the field, all of them were making their post their World Series debut. And I think Charlie Morton's the only World Series winner on that roster, much less World Series appearance guy on that roster. So the Dodgers certainly there in the have the advantage in the experience column, but this is a good baseball team, the Rays, that that don't make a lot of mistakes. And the the Dodgers have some guys in the back end of that rotation that don't have a lot of experience on the mound in the World Series and have some and certainly won't be quite as lights out as Kershaw was. At least you don't think. Now, they got really nice pitching staff. Not going to act like that they don't. But this series certainly isn't over. It's just clear how good the Dodgers are, and it's clear what the Rays are going to have to do to win this series and to win games in this series. And what they're going to have to do is make very few mistakes, keep the game within striking distance, and also keep it low scoring. And that's a really, really tall task against a team like the Dodgers who have the weapons that they do. Game two is tonight. First pitch, 808 Eastern on Fox once again. Probable pitchers, Blake Snell, the left-hander going for the for the Rays against Tony Gonsolin, the right-hander going for the Dodgers. Series certainly isn't over yet, but the Dodgers, that is a that is a good baseball team, and they proved it, showed it, not proved it, but they showed it in, in many, many ways last night in Game 1 of the World Series. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the new Pacers head coach, Nate Bjorkren. Uh, he's a first-time head coach that was a Toronto Raptors assistant previously. Going to look here during the break at, at what's some of the more interesting parts of of the press conference so far in the last 20 minutes but we'll do that next on the jamal show 110 sportsmedia.com
Welcome back to the Jamal Show on a Wednesday. Twitch.tv, 110 Sports, 110sportsmedia.com slash live. Thank you so much for joining us on a Wednesday right now. The Pacers introducing their new head coach, Nate Bjorkren, to the masses. Uh, being introduced, speaking for the first time as the Pacers' new head coach. Real quick, before I, I touch on what I've been seeing on Twitter uh, about the the press conference, let's talk about some of his credentials, I suppose. 45-year-old coach, coach coached in the G League from 27, 2007 to 2015 for three different teams. He was a, a head coach in the G League from 2011 to 2015. Uh, from 2007 to 2011, he was... Uh, an assistant coach under Nick Nurse. Nick Nurse, uh, who is now the Raptors head coach, and when Nick Nurse got that job in Toronto, asked Bjorkren to be a part of his coaching staff. Uh, he's actually the only assistant coach to win a championship in the G League and the NBA. And he did it with Nick Nurse. If that tells you anything about it. Uh, Nick Nurse, he was uh, a Suns assistant for two years under Jeff Hornacek and then reunited with Nurse and, and then spent time as a player development guy in Toronto before Nurse na it was named head coach and then became a coaching uh, assistant under Nick Nurse uh, for that coaching staff. Has chops as a player developer, uh, including developing TJ Warren while he was a part of that Suns organization. Of course, now one of the uh, leading scorers for the Pacers. What I'm seeing from uh, on Twitter in terms of what he's saying in the press conference. For some reason, my mouse is not working. Maybe this will work. Nope, that's interesting. All right. Do I have anything working? Okay, we're going to keep going. It looks like we're we're good. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, Kevin Bowen, he's the uh, he's a uh content producer over at 1070 the Fan uh, local ESPN affiliate and Indy uh covers pretty much all sp uh, Indianapolis sports. Uh Kevin Pritchard of the Pacers said he was looking for high character, winning pedigree. Uh, as an assistant or head coach in any league, we talked about that assistant. Uh, he won a championship as an assistant, both in the G League and the NBA. Uh, innovative, the meaning push the envelope in modern basketball, willing to take more risks needed in the playoffs. Uh, number four, communicator and unifier. Uh, Bjorken on his offense and defense said, uh, on the offensive side of things, weak side movement. Different guys handling it and pushing it. More possessions, attacking, utilizing the free throw and three-point line. McMillan was certainly... There were times with McMillan that you felt like he wasn't going to... He wasn't getting the most out of that offense. And and, and this is one of my biggest things with head coaching decisions is, is make a change that clearly m switches up the locker room in one way, shape, or form. And this certainly does that. Um, this certainly does that with Bjorkren. On the defensive side, he said disruptive, not going to be crazy. Defense will change quite frequently out of a out of a timeout during free throws, etc. He said, he, like I said, discussed an emphasis on the three point line and free throws. Um, very disruptive, very aggressive in style. These are all good things for the Pacers and, and a, a switch up in in style uh, compared to compared to Nate McMillan. Pritchard also said that he was asking candidates to explain what they would implement with the current roster rather than any roster that might be because this is an interesting time for the Pacers. They have guys that are all relatively young, but at the same time, the future is up in the air. Uh, they're not entirely sure what what Victor Oladipo is going to do. Miles Turner. Sabonis is awesome, and every you know last year became a very important part of that offense. TJ Warren, and he always was, but really turned into a playmaker first option kind of guy 
for the Pacers. TJ Warren, of course, really good. They they have Malcolm Brogdon. They have this really awesome roster, but it's it's a little bit in flux, which is it looks like something that that Bjorkren is going to be able to handle, um, and is going to be able to 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 maximize some things uh, for the Pacers. Quick shout out to if you want to read this story, it's over at indiecornrows.com, the SB Nation uh, site for the Pacers, written by Caitlin Cooper. She's she's awesome, and and, and you're not going to find a story going deeper into what what Bjorkren did as a head coach in the G League more than this story. It's a really great way to look at this. So shouts to her, but she, you know, looking at things like Bjorken coached a lot of different teams in the, his G League career with a lot of flexibility and and exposure that the Pacers could could really use. You know, team, you know, young teams teaching them to live at the free throw line and and get to and, and not turn the ball over to a team that. trying to get them to live on the offensive to to live on the defensive side with a gritty defensive team um manufacturing points out of stops he had a lot of different teams in the G League and that's what happens with G League coaches because there's so much rotation based on the the resources and the personnel that you have at your disposal at that time in the season as you know you got guys on two-way contracts guys being traded so on and so forth and that, that I think that's going to be really helpful for the Pacers. You know, I think that Nurse has a, and this was the other thing I wanted to touch on. I think Nurse has a bit of a complex, similar to that of Sean McVay, the Rams head coach, because McVay just busted onto the scene, and 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 Nurse. Nurse isn't the same in the sense that he's also really young like McVay. I mean, Sean McVay is 34 years old, born January 24th, 1986, so he's about to be 35. So that's ridiculous. Nurse is 53 years old, so it's not like he's in a similar stage of life, but he is in a similar stage of being, being quickly realized as one of the best basketball minds in the NBA. I mean, as a coach from 1989 to 2013, 89 to 2013, he coached the Northern I. He was a Northern Iowa assistant coach, a Derby Rams player coach, Grandview, South Dakota assistant, Birmingham Bullets, Talindus Ustende, which sounds like yep, a Belgian basketball team, um, and then bounced around the G, you know, the London Towers, the Oklahoma Storm, Brighton Bears, Oklahoma Storm again, Iowa Energy, Rio Grande Valley. Rio Grande Valley Vipers then he got his shot as a t Toronto Raptors assistant and then hired as a head coach and since he was hired he's been an NBA champion an NBA coach of the year an NBA all-star game head coach an NBA D-League champion an NBA D-League coach of the year all in the last 10 years I think assistants especially guys like Bjorkren are going to be in a position where they're going to be really looked at because of that, because of what nurse has done and who nurse is in the hierarchy of NBA head coaches. Now I'm really excited to see what this change of pace does for the Pacers. I think they, I, I, I'm not so sure that McMillan deserved to be fired, but I am really intrigued by this change of pace for this organization and this change of pace 
for this basketball team. I'm very intrigued by that. Bjork is saying I wanted this job so bad because of the talent on this team and the work ethic of this team. That's the that's the really interesting thing here, and, and the, uh, something that's becoming more common in the NBA. And and most of the firings and hirings of the or separations of coach and team have been with teams that are in positions to be good basketball teams. The Nets hiring Steve Nash. The Pacers getting rid of Nate McMillan despite having this roster. The Clippers and Doc Rivers. The, the 76ers and Brett Brown. It's all over the place. And what you've got is this really interesting change of pace for a team that is trying to win now. I mean... That is, that's not all that. I mean, Billy Donovan getting hired by the Bulls, not because the Bulls are, I mean, what was happening in Chicago was bad, but the more common thing this with coaches being hired recently is good basketball teams that are trying to get a change of pace. They're trying to maximize whatever it might be. So I'm excited to see what Bjorkren brings to this Pacers organization, what this team looks like where they're better, where they might be a little bit worse than they were with Nate McMillan. I mean, I'm super intrigued by all of it. And, um, of course we'll learn more about him and, uh, his coaching style and how it, the, the early, um, the early days of his tenure as the Pacers head coach goes, as we, as we move forward, uh, we're actually going to talk about this as well on Jay's today's podcast. That'll be recorded tomorrow morning and we'll get that out on Thursday uh, to get Josh's uh, opinions and thoughts on the Pacers head coach as well. Coming up next, the, the Dallas Cowboys are train wreck. In case you didn't know, we got finger pointing. We got, we, we got a lot to talk about. And, and a lot to laugh about, to be honest with you, because the Cowboys, despite making a coaching change, are still a train wreck and in a lot of ways a bigger train wreck than they were before hiring Jason Garrett, uh, firing Jason Garrett and hiring Mike McCarthy. We'll talk about what's going on in Dallas coming up next on the JML Show, 110sportsmedia.com.
Welcome back to the Jamal Show on a Wednesday, twitch.tv slash 110sports, 110sportsmedia.com slash live. Boy, oh boy, are the Cowboys fun to watch for every reason other than they're good at football. Because it's like, it's like a reality TV show. What's going to happen this time? It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. It really is. It, it, it's, it's laugh out loud funny. Laugh out loud funny. How much the Cowboys... I mean, the Cowboys are one of the, the, the most lucrative franchises in the world. In this country, of course. They just can't figure it out on the football field. Ever. It's, it's so bad. This time around... The NFL Network's Jane Slater has had at least two Cowboys players basically say, I don't I don't care anymore. I'm speaking out of turn. I'm not, you know, the unspoken protocol or the protocol within the organization. I'm going after my head coaches. Quote, an unnamed player. A quote, they don't teach. They don't have any sense of adjusting on the fly. Another added, quote, they just aren't good at their jobs. Now, of course, Dak Prescott, horrible, one of the uh, brutal ankle injury. And so that doesn't help, of course. But the defense is allowing the fifth most points in league history after six games. And they're tied with Las Vegas and Green Bay for the fewest forced takeaways in football. It's It's just... It's just horrible. And so clearly, clearly some of that probably has to be put on the, on the coaching staff. I'm not, I'm I'm not necessarily arguing with that. There's, I mean, I thought, I think Mark McCarthy, Mike McCarthy is a good coach. I thought there were some questionable calls with the assistant and and coordinator side of things. But there's also clearly so like like I'm a big believer in like it takes a special kind of coach to really make a difference to to not be interchangeable. And Mike McCarthy while a solid coach is interchangeable. The bigger issue is what's happening on the football field. Let me okay. Andy Dalton throws two interceptions. That's I, I that I, I'm not sure how that's a, a coaching staff's fault. Maybe you're uh, frustrated with the with the play calling, but but despite how bad the play calling is, like you can probably like bad play calling results in like you clearly not getting the most out of your your quarterback. That you feel like you're sort of holding him to a box, not necessarily that the 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 interceptions are, are the coach's fault. So Andy Dalton throws two interceptions, first of all. He gets sacked three times. That's not Andy Dalton's fault, but it's also not the coaching staff's fault. Just be better on your offensive line. Ezekiel Elliott fumbles the ball twice. I really, like, there's literally no way to say that that's the coaching staff's fault. And there's also just clearly a lack of intensity and effort on some plays from the the Cowboys' defense. The Cowboys' league league worst turnover ratio now is minus 12. So they've turned the ball over 12 more times in turnovers that they've forced. Yes, the Cowboys have been hit with a string of bad luck. You know, seven-time Pro Bowler Tyron Smith, you know, out with a neck injury, first-round picks out. There's just, you know, they, they need another corner after Byron Jones signs a contract with the Dolphins. It's It's such a train wreck. 
and, and to and to Dalton and Ellie, and Dalton and and Elliot's credit, they both did take responsibility last night. After that game, excuse me, it was two nights ago. They did both take credit for that. So 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 you you do give them credit for that, but it, it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if you're not if your entire team isn't taking responsibility. And maybe we're talking on the defensive side of the football. It wouldn't surprise me at all if we're talking about the defensive side of the football because that defense is horrible. But this is this is an absolute train wreck. The Arizona offense ran rampant. Like Arizona's offense is is not not great. I mean. Murray's really, really good. Kyler Murray. But it's not like this is a a world-beating offense or world-beating football team. Not in the slightest. It's baffling to me. Like the the Cowboys should never lose thirty eight to ten to a Cardinals team like this. And and it's the most Cowboys thing in the world for players to come out and talk smack about what the coaching staff is doing after it's over, rather than just taking responsibility for the issues at hand. They're so bad. And, and and year after year, they're supposed to have a good football team. They've had some unfortunate injuries, yes. But it's just, it's a train wreck there. And Jerry Jones is useless. And they're, they're embarrassing. What happened to the Cowboys on Monday Night Football was embarrassing. And, and and now what do you like th- that is that a mendable relationship when a player goes above a coach's head to talk crap about him? I don't know. And and, and even if the culture in a in a locker room was good, that still is is hard to mend. But in a place like the Cowboys locker room where the culture is non existent other than it's quote unquote f- America's football team. America's football team sucks, y'all. Horrible. And this is not the, the this is not a, this is not a, a Cowboys locker room that has anybody holding others accountable. Maybe Dak is that guy, but when he's got a broken angle, he's not there in the locker room every day like that. So it's not like you have a guy that's going to go be like, like, listen, this is not what we do around here. And you certainly don't have a trust between player and coach to be able to sit down and have conversations that actually are going to be constructive. You know what's interesting? And we can look at the standings real quick. But so so you've got no more Dak. And apart from the Jets, who are 0 6, you've got a lot of one loss football teams. And you and, and, and the Cowboys, in terms of teams that look like they're never gonna win football games again. The Cowboys are really close to the top of that list. I say that to say, what if they're just horrible the rest of the season and go three and three and thirteen, two and fourteen? Now, I doubt they lose ten straight football games, especially against an NFC East that is just horrible. And this is and it's laugh out loud funny. Dallas still is leading this division. But what if Dallas is ultimately in the running for Trevor Lawrence? What if they lose 10 straight football games and they're up there with the, the Jets? Now, I think the Jets are going to take care of this. You know, they're like, let's just take all the confidence out of Sam Darnold. Let's get rid of Le'Veon Bell and let's go 0-16 and let's get Trevor Lawrence. There's part of me that really hopes that's not going to happen because, like, Trevor Lawrence, the Jets is are where high-level athletes go to 
to die. <laughs> Where high level athletes go to and high draft picks that just go to be irrelevant. And I really don't want Trevor Lawrence to be relevant. And I and, and, and maybe even more so, I don't want Trevor Lawrence to be great in the in as a jet. I don't know. I just don't I that just doesn't that fails the out loud test. But this is interesting. Cause what you know, what if they go two and fourteen? And end up with the worst record in football. You got to go get Trevor Lawrence because there's a chance he's one of the best quarterbacks of all time. Like like, like a, a, a very small chance because every rookie has a very, very small chance. But, but you can't pass on Trevor Lawrence. You can't. Even if you have Dak Prescott, there's too much of a chance that he could be the next Peyton Manning. Or, you know, insert whoever you want to there. Whoever you, th- you know, there's too much of a shot. Or the next Patrick Mahomes. There's too much of a shot. I don't think we're actually going to get there, but it's an interesting conversation because after last after Monday night, it looks like the Cowboys are never going to win another football game ever. Coming up next, we'll do some FY. Get out of here on a Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us on a Wednesday. You're watching the Jim Show, Wanton Sports Media. Welcome back to the Jamal Show on a Wednesday, wrapping up the show here with some FYI. For your information, Clayton Kershaw last night passed John Smoltz for the second most strikeouts in postseason history. Next on that list, Justin Verlander. And this this might be the the epitome of stats don't tell the whole story. Because 
Kershaw, Kershaw's part of his definition is just an incredible regular season pitcher whose postseason stats don't match up, and that's become part of his legacy. I mean, right? But if you were to... If you were to look at the all-time strikeout leaders in postseason history, Clayton Kershaw would be two. And you would assume that Clayton Kershaw is an elite postseason pitcher. At least that's a fair assumption, right? Not the case. And and, and that's just a, a perfect example of... of you got to watch the games too, uh, because he might strike out a bunch of guys. But but and and we, uh, my one ten sports colleague Chris Brown and I were talking about this while watching the the game one last night, uh, that his career his career ERA in each round of the postseason goes up by one. So in the regular season, his career ERA is two point two uh, around two point five. And then in the wild card, it's three point five. In the champion, in, in the, or in the divisional, it's three point five, four point five in the championship series, and five point five in the World Series. It's just funny that that is that he's going to be, assuming he throws another game in this series, he's going to surpass or at least get really close and next season pass him for the most strikeouts in postseason history, and that's just that doesn't tell the full story. So for your information. Kershaw, now the second most strikeouts in postseason history, and he very soon, whether it's this in this series or next year, uh, will ultimately become the strikeouts leader in, in, in postseason history. For your information, Tua. Tua is the new is the QB one. Uh, for the Miami Dolphins now, uh, seeing what he did with, um, seeing what he did after the game, going and sit on the 15 yard line where he dislocated his hip as, uh, as an Alabama Crimson Tide was was cool to see, and and him getting his chances, the move, him being the future, is certainly is certainly the move they make him the QB now. And so now he's get he gets two weeks worth of preparation because he's got uh, a bye week, and and they don't play again until November first against the Los Angeles Rams. But Tua is now the guy in Miami uh, for the Dolphins. You knew that was going to be the case. It was just a matter of when. Uh, and again, in case you're you're just joining us, Nate Bjorkren, Bjorkren excuse me is the new head coach of the Pacers. You got to do some more research on him as well. Watch that press conference back just to, to get to my bearings on who he is as a, as a coach, what his plans are as the Pacers head coach. And then, of course, touch on talk with Josh Storing, 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow, uh, followed by Around the Bases with Chris Brown at 1 p.m. Eastern. They'll touch on all things soccer and baseball for you. Make sure you check those out right here at 110sportsmedia.com slash live or twitch.tv slash 110sports. I, per usual, will be back on Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. We'll see what there is to talk about then. Uh, maybe we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about World Series. I'm sure maybe there'll be some some other NBA news to talk about between now and then uh and oh and finally i've joined uh a along with 110 sports i've joined the fan-sided uh memphis grizzlies uh page uh beelstreetbears.com uh, as a contributor for them so i'm excited to get started over there as well uh covering this young exciting grizzlies team but uh, i believe that's all i have for you i'll be back at 11 a.m eastern on friday we'll find something to talk about by then until then stay safe and i'll talk to you again on friday